Well, welcome to part one of Hidden Roots panel discussion to learn more about Upper Arlington's remarkable Black history featuring the history and legacy of Pleasant Litchford. Uh, I first want to thank um, Yukemi Jeter and J.P. Duvall and Catherine Kennedy, the planning committee chairs for this event. They will help manage the chat where you as viewers can submit questions. As chair of UA's Community Relations Committee, it was established by the city council in the fall of 2020, following an extensive assessment process dating back to the spring of 2019 that was born out of the desire by many in our community to advance Upper Arlington as a place that is welcoming, cohesive, and inclusive. The initial assessment phase included two workshops and a survey to help identify areas that require attention and steps that could help to address those challenging areas. Together, we will work to nurture our deep sense of community and neighborliness through activities designed to enhance understanding, appreciation, communication, and mutual respect for all members of our community. So it's only fitting tonight that we bring together the city, the schools, UA Historical Society, and other UA groups to present a two-part panel discussion on Pleasant Lynchford for Black History Month. Many people are not aware that Upper Arlington has its own remarkable Black history. Some of you have heard the name Pleasant Litchford, a man born in 1789, who purchased his, his family's freedom out of slavery in Litchburg, Virginia. They moved to what is now our hometown of UA, where Pleasant- Lord, Can I stop you for a minute and ask you to speak a little louder? I can, I, I'm, I'm trying to speak as loud as I can. Okay. Um, uh, became, uh, uh, let me start here. Uh, uh, Litchford was a master blacksmith, became an important part of the greater community as well as one of the largest landowners in the area. In fact, his property stretched across the very heart of UA from what would become North Star Road to the high school across from Northam Park, past Tremont Elementary and beyond Tremont Center. Historian and founding chair of the James Preston Ponexer Foundation, Rita Smith explains that the well being of a community is like a tree. You must take care of the roots in order for it to grow healthy and strong. In this way, we must take care of our history, the roots from which we grow as a community. When Kim Shoemaker Starr and Diane Kelly Run discovered the Litchford Cemetery and thus the story Pleasant, uh, Pleasant Litchford, Upper Arlington community, they uncovered an important part of the roots of our community. This Black History Month, we celebrate the history of Pleasant Litchford, the story of its rediscovery, and the stewardship of his story into the future. Now, I would like to show you, we would like to show you, uh, the Columbus Neighborhood film, which won an Emmy by one of my church members, Charlene Brown, who produced this event. Hope you enjoy it. Powerful forces built up the area. And there are few records to document these vibrant people, much beyond the memories and scrapbooks of their descendants. So I was stunned to learn African Americans once made their home in what is now the exclusive enclave of Upper Arlington. I was doing research after I cleaned all the cemeteries in Upper Arlington. I wanted to find out who those people were the McCoys, the Bacchuses, the Richardsons, Legs. I went to the library and I found a paragraph in the, one of the papers I was reading that said, quote, a Negro family cemetery was on the land that Brighton High School was built. The bodies were removed and taken to Union and Greenlawn Cemetery. And I'm like, what? Stop, what? 
I wanted to know more. I had never heard of this pioneer history. Pleasant Litchford came from Lynchburg, Virginia. He was a master blacksmith. His wife and his four sons, who were teenagers to young adults at that time, were also working the same plantation. When they were freed, at that time in Virginia, you had one year to leave Virginia or you would be back into slavery. So everybody. So even though you had been freed. Yeah. If you, you had stayed, one year, you, you had to get out of Dodge. Again. Yeah. And so they came through the wilderness to Columbus in 1828. And people were sleeping in tents in their covered wagons and stuff. Franklinton was just a new town. So this was really just wilderness at that time. Pleasant Litchford's trade was much in demand in this growing settlement. So he found plenty of work here. A blacksmith would make locks, they make nails, they make anything made of metal that you would need to build, you know, doorknobs, a utility where to cook. They didn't just make horseshoes for horses, they made everything. So they were really an important person in any society. And he made sure all his boys became blacksmiths. Way before today's Upper Arlington, early white pioneers such as the Miller family and the William Neal family purchased property and began to farm Perry Township, employing both white and black hired hands. While whites could live wherever they wanted to, options for African Americans were more limited. Those who wanted to start farms of their own found opportunities outside the city, and Pleasant Litchford found a home in Perry Township. In the early 1830s, I think 1833, he bought his first part of land from the Lake family. And all these white farmers were selling him all kinds of land, which gave him the ability to be the fourth largest landowner in Perry Township. All the land that he owned was all the land that's the high school, St. Agatha, the Tremont Center, the library, Tremont School. We look at back in the 50s, 60s, some white communities would not sell to a person of color, but they were selling him land like crazy. So you know that he was respected by his community. We do know that William Neal of the Neal House paid his black law bond to show that he was a good character. Okay, explain the black law bond. The black law bond was a $500 bond that you had to pay to <clears throat> say that you were a person of good character and that you wouldn't cause problems. If you were black. If you were black. The black law bonds were abolished in the 1840s. Litchford knew education was critical if African Americans were to succeed. He made sure his own children were educated, and, like his white counterparts, he established a school on his land, another priceless find buried in the archives. I hear this crying in the deed office, and she's going, come here, come here, come here. And look, the deed to the colored school from Pleasant Litchford to the Board of Education. That's amazing. And it was like, what? These records, these memories are buried in the archives of Columbus. Which is really interesting because I think in modern times, we kind of think of the blacksmith as, you know, uneducated guy, really good working with his hands, mm -hmm. but not necessarily an a person of intellect or um, having an interest in things like education. Right. But this man, because of his success, he clearly had a lot going for him. Absolutely. He was one of the founders of the Second Baptist Church, which is the largest Baptist church here in Columbus still. James Poindexter also was one of the pastors of that church. James Poindexter is part of the James Poindexter buildings that they've just saved. They were very close, and they are both on the rolls of going to an anti-slavery convention here in Columbus in 1840. They would run the Underground Railroad through Pleasant's property to the Scioto so they could go up the Scioto to Lucy Depp because two of his children married into the Depp family. So now they had this network and it was a family underground business. 
In 1879, Pleasant Litchford died, a wealthy and respected man, laid to rest in his own cemetery, which he set aside for his family, as well as others in the Black community who were barred from white cemeteries. But that's not where his story ends. In the 1950s, the city of Upper Arlington decided to build a high school and purchased a huge tract of land once owned by Pleasant Litchford. And as the building development moved forward, the very old and long forgotten Litchford Cemetery was found. When the school board first contacted us and said they had 14 to 16 individuals, we would have located a space within the cemetery that would have had that many spaces together. Union Cemetery has meticulous records for each of its Litchford graves. This is the activity from October 31st of 1955, and we're registering a uh, internment of an unidentified individual, which we're calling number three. Um, we call out the lot and section of the cemetery where this individual is going to be buried. These are actually adult-sized vaults, and then we get a little smaller. So these are child-sized vaults. There were headstones. I've seen a photograph that was printed in the dispatch. That's a photo in 1955. In that photo, there are headstones. They're not in rows like a cemetery would be. They're just kind of in a pile next to some trees and brambles. So, you know, these stones may have fallen apart. Are there still bodies? in that ground under the parking lot. Mr. Litchford, in his will, actually designated a half acre of land for this cemetery. And it was very clear in the land records where that half acre was being separated. As long as the burial stayed within that half acre, then you know that half acre should have been fully uh, checked during this 1955 um, activity. But that's only if, it's only if they all stayed within that boundary Correct. of that half acre. Would there have been cemetery records at the Litchford Cemetery? The Litchford Family Bible would have probably cataloged deaths in the family, but those records have been lost to the test of time. Sadly, we may never know the names of those individuals. One headstone that's known to have survived from the Litchford Cemetery is now in the prayer garden at Second Baptist Church. We would love to know who all these people are. Um, even if we can't tell that story on an individual by individual basis, we want to try to catalog as much information about the Litchford family as possible because this is their final resting place. I had to see the final resting place of Pleasant Litchford and the others buried with him. It took a little searching in a far corner of Union Cemetery, but finally, there it was. It felt like finding my own family. And may those of us who remain continue to uncover their story and begin to honor them as they deserve. Thank you for that. And at this time, I would like to introduce to all of you my good friend and our school superintendent of Upper Arlington, Mr. Paul Imhoff. Well, great, uh, great to, uh, thanks, Floyd, and great to see everybody. And just awesome to be with you this evening and to be a part of part one, Hidden Roots. Uh, this is such an important story, and I've noticed I hope I don't miss anyone, but we got a couple of important people with us. I know that uh, Toya and Jim as members of the Litchford family are with us tonight. And so as you're listening, I just wanted to say hi to both of you and any other members of the Litchford family who are with us uh, this evening. Uh, it's been estimated that the cemetery was established in 1835, just a few years after Pleasant settled in what is now the heart of Upper Arlington. After he died in 1879 at the age of 89, Pleasant's land was divided among his remaining 
seven children. The land where the cemetery stood went to his daughter, Catherine, who sold the land in around 1900. Even so, uh, there continue to be burials at the Litchford Cemetery up until 1925. Upper Arlington had just been incorporated in 1918, but this was still before the cemetery land was included in the UA city limits. Time passed and we fast forward to 1955, 30 years later. And this was an important year in the civil rights movement as it was the year in which Rosa Parks was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on the bus. By 1955, the land that included the Litchford Cemetery had been purchased by the Upper Arlington Board of Education, and there were plans to build a new high school. Having purchased the land on which the cemetery stood, the Board of Education committed $5,000 to move 10 bodies, but ended up moving 27 over the course of three days. Most went to Union Cemetery and were placed in an unmarked plot. From there, the story of Pleasant and his descendants went silent in much of UA. Now in collaboration with the city and the schools and the historical society and many other valuable uh, or organizations around town, it's our pleasure to welcome you to part one of our two-part panel discussion. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Carl Smallwood, who's here to facilitate our discussion on our hidden roots. Carl recently retired from a 38-year career as a lawyer and partner with Voorhees, Sater, Seymour, and Pease, and is now the co-director of the Divided Community Project, affiliated with the Moritz College of Law. Carl is also a 1974 graduate of UA High School. Go Bears! Carl, great to have, have you here tonight, and it is all yours. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Paul, um, and good evening, everybody. Uh, as, as Paul said, I'm Carl Smallwood, um, and I work with the Divided Community Project now, which helps communities and their leaders to address conflict and division in communities along racial, uh, religious, uh, and other uh, fractures in communities. Um, and I was, I was privileged and humbled to be asked to facilitate this conversation tonight, in part because I have my own history in Upper Arlington. I'm a 1974 graduate of Upper Arlington High School. My family moved here in the early 1970s, and I started as a sophomore at, uh, at UA. Um, there were only three classes at the high school then, about 700 students per class. And my senior year, I was one of two black students at Upper Arlington High School out of about 2,100 students. So, since that time, I've lived in Upper Arlington for more than 40 of the last 50 years. And I was unaware of Pleasant Litchford and this story when I was in school here and was unaware for many years after. So I'm excited to join you this evening and to, to bring to you this panel of experts who've done the work, the hard work to discover the story of Pleasant Litchford and share it with you. And let me introduce them to you now. Uh, first is Kim Shoemaker Starr, who's a preservationist and a co-author of Secrets Under the Parking Lot. She was a year ahead of me at Upper Arlington High School uh, in the class of 1973, and she is a current uh, Upper Arlington resident. Uh, next is Diane Kelly Runyon, who is the owner and principal of Linkage Links, a genealogical and historical research firm, um, as well as a co-author on Secrets Under the Parking Lot. Next is Kristen Greenberg, who is the assistant director of the Upper Arlington Historical Society. Uh, she's been there for six years and she also lives in Upper Arlington. Next is John Schweikert, John is an anthropologist and an archeologist, a trustee of the Ohio Archeological Council and an Upper Arlington resident. Next is Rita Smith. She is a historian, the founding chair of the James Preston Poindexter Foundation. And she too lives in Upper Arlington. So a lot of people from Upper Arlington. And then Sandra Jamison, Jamison um, who's a second generation historian and a servant leader of the Heritage Ministry 
at Second Baptist Church, which is the oldest Black Baptist church in Columbus, dating back to about 19, uh, 1824. So we've brought you this panel of experts for our discussion this evening, uh, and we're now going to dig a little bit deeper into the hidden roots uh, behind this story. So Kim, if I could, if I could start with you, uh, because I think this sort of gets us into the story, how did you discover Pleasant Litchford and what did you decide to do with that discovery? Well, I have to start a little bit back to tell you how I started getting into preserving um, cemeteries and headstones. That mm -hmm. was very important to me. Um, I, I've cleaned headstones all across the country, over 700 as a volunteer. And so I moved away for 18 years. I moved to California and I came back in 2014, in the beginning of 2014. And when I came back, I decided I was going to clean the cemeteries in Up Arlington, the two cemeteries. And then there's Bill Moose's, but that's not really a cemetery. So no, there's a river rock, so I can't clean those. So I cleaned both cemeteries, the Leg Walcott, Richard McCoy Cemetery, cleaned all the headstones. And when I was done, I decided I would go over to this, like the documentary said, I would go to the library and I was reading through who these pioneers were. McCoy, yes, I know McCoy Road, but I don't know who really who they were. Yes, I graduated from Upper Arlington. I didn't learn this. I have six children. They graduated from Upper Arlington. They never knew this. So I was reading about them and I came across a paragraph. I have no idea what part of it what was in there, but it said, quote, a Negro, a Negro family cemetery was on the land they built up Arlington High School. The bodies were removed and taken to Green Lawn and Union Cemetery. And I was, I just, I read that several times. I couldn't believe what I was reading. How, how is this possible? Is this really true? I mean, what is going on? So I went to Union Cemetery and I asked them, I said, do you know anything about this? And they said, we need a name. So I'm not a genealogist. I, I work with the dead, but I'm not a genealogist. Um, so I called one of my dearest friends, Diane Runyon. We've been friends for 45 years and she owns a genealogy business and said, help me, help me. So this was the end, this is the beginning of 2015 is when I got a hold of her. So for seven years, we've been doing this. So I called Diane, I said, help me find this. Two days later, we met together and she had found the name. And from that moment on, this has been seven years of working to get the story out, get this history changed the way it should have been um, documented in the very beginning and have Pleasant Litchford and all these members of uh, uh, this community that has been um, forgotten for all these years uncovered and people taught this history in school. What a rich history. And the only thing I want to say also before I pass it over to Diane is that the love a community has for its people is how they respect their cemeteries. We've got to respect our cemeteries. Those people matter. Even though they're gone, their lives mattered. So thank you. Well, thank you, Kim. And, and, and I guess you've already set up Diane, who, who, to whom you turned <laughs> uh, for this genealogical research. Diane, if, if you wouldn't mind now, why don't you tell us how you went about doing this research to find the ancestry of Pleasant Litchford. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I've been a professional researcher for, you know, been doing genealogy almost 45 years. So um, basically this was research that had to be done with the boots on the ground, doing the hard work because it's not something you could just go on ancestry and find. You had to dig, dig, dig. And there was very few mentions of Pleasant Litchford in any publications. So the first thing I did is I networked with the people that really mattered. Kim and I met with, with Sandra and Rita and some other wonderful black historians and they helped us go on this journey together. And so what we did is we would go to the libraries and sit in the stacks for hours and hours and hours. So if anybody's over 40 and knows what sitting on the floor for hours and hours looks like when you get up, it's not pretty at all. But we, did, we do have a lot of work that we've done. We went to Union Cemetery, we got the burial records, 
we were at the engineer's office and we were at the recorder's office an awful lot. And I know when they saw us coming, they had to draw the short straw who was gonna take care of us for the day. So we were looking at wills and deeds and we've been everywhere. So we've crossed the country looking for um, research that had to be done old school style. So when and you we said across the country, what do you mean? Oh, well, we've been California, uh, Virginia, we've been to Cleveland, we've been to Salt Lake, we've been everywhere. And this has not been an easy journey because it had to be all done by hand and you had to have primary source. If you didn't have a primary source for that, it didn't count. You had to, because we're both daughters of the American Revolution and they're picky about their sources. So we know how that all works. The newspaper, old newspapers were hugely important in, into getting the research we needed, especially in Salt Lake City. And so we have a lot of stories that um, reach um, far and wide for Pleasant Litchford. Um, also, when we ended up having two feet, actually I measured it, two feet worth of documentation we thought, what are we going to do with all these documents? Are they gonna end up in a banker box in someone's garage? This is history that no one has had available. So we wrote a book. And I used to be a history teacher in Grandview Heights, seventh grade, and I wrote the book to be focused on students in, the, in those middle grades because we were not teaching this in school. And it was a shame because local history, it taught Ohio history, never mentioned it, never. And um, it's very important to know where we came from and all the sacrifices they made to make the community what it is. Well, thank you. Before I, before I turn to Kristen, there's a question in the, in the chat function that said, what's so important about Salt Lake City? You mentioned that as part of your genealogical research. Can you explain that? Oh, that was a great find. And it's in our book. Um, Miles Litchford, who was a Pleasant's oldest son, ran away from home. Um, he was in probably late teens, early 20s, uh, over some argument, never came home until his dad passed away. He went to the South and hooked up with Green Flake, who there's a movie coming out about him and his journey. And they hooked up with Brigham Young and went to Salt Lake City. And his daughter ended up inheriting a piece of land that was left to Pleasant, left to his son. His son had passed away, and Catherine Walker Litchford, Litchford Walker, actually owned a piece of uh, that Pleasant Litchford property there in Upper Arlington. And that is a very compelling story. But that all came from newspapers and and doing hard work with um, the archives in Salt Lake. Well, I, I know I know there are archives, and there's a lot of people have done genealogical research in, in uh, the Mormon Church has got a yes. repository. <laughs> but I, apparently, there's a more personal connection to Salt Lake City. Yes, it was fascinating. Okay. Very good. Well, well, Kristen, let me turn to you. I, I understand the um, UA Historical Society has also uncovered an interesting piece of history regarding the land transfer from the Litchford family to the UA school board in the 1950s. Can you share that with us? Sure, I'd, I'd love to. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to take you in the next few minutes on what I call a time and space journey that hopefully will help you um, create a framework to kind of put all these facts and organize it about Pleasant's life. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen because um, the best way to do this that I know is visually. Um, so we're going to start with something that we do know. This is Upper Arlington today, as we're familiar with our city's boundaries. But I want to take you, um, obviously, this didn't exist forever. So I want to take you back in time over 150 years ago, back to 1856. And um, introduce you to Perry Township, which is where Pleasant lived. 
And to give you, again, a frame of reference, I've kind of crudely uh, placed Upper Arlington as it is today over the Perry Township. So you can see that we were the southernmost point of that um, township. To zoom in closer on, his, on the southern part, and I want to get a pointer here, um, we see Pleasance land. We see, um, let me get you the frame of reference here. This is Lane Avenue today, and then this is Tremont Road. So hopefully that grounds most of you as to where this land is, um, as someone had said, around Northern Park area, and then over by where the high school is today. He had 137 acres in this parcel and 90 acres um, here. That happened in three separate purchases, these in the 1830s and this in 1849. So by 1856, these, this was his land. This is his residence here, as denoted on the map. It is a significant amount of land. He was the fourth largest landowner south of what we know today as Fishinger Road. So I promised you a time as well. So we're gonna do a quick timeline here, again, visually. Uh, about 23 years after that, in 1879, Pleasant does die. And he divides those 227 acres up among his children. And that's where we see the written documentation of the cemetery. Um, it says in his will, there's a small parcel of ground of about half an acre, which has been by me for years devoted to burial purposes for my family, relatives, and friends. And it shall be maintained and kept up by them and their descendants. That's physically in his will. So again, he passed in 1879. This is 1883. And we can see the land now divided up into separate parcels. This was typical of families back then. If you note of the Adams down here, these are Adams children. So this is what happened at the time. Um, the reason I have this, um, Highlighted is it's Catherine Depp's land that she was a daughter and that is where our high school sits today and that is where our research focused on the land transfers from the time of Catherine Depp to the time that the high school purchased the land. So back to the timeline just to make a few notes. Um, in 1900 Catherine Depp and her daughters sell that land to non Litchford people. So by 1900, that highlighted portion of land is no longer um, under a Litchford ownership. Um, in 1906, someone who was on the land had a mortgage default and there was a court case. And in that court case, it's the first time in a legal document that it referenced a half acre that was accepted and reserved. And the deed following that court case also referenced that half acre. And what that did is it formally recognized that the Litchford heirs had egress, ingress and egress to that cemetery and the use of the cemetery property. And that the people who own the land around it did not have a legal interest in that half acre of land. So in 1906, that was official. Again, frame of reference, uh, in 1913, uh, King and Ben Thompson bought two, uh, 840 acres to start Upper Arlington. That's all south of Lane and had nothing to do with any lands that Litchford held. We grew northward over time through annexation. Um, if you're not familiar with the term annexation, it is a typical way that cities grow. Um, they come to an agreement to take over the municipal services for an area. So your um, fire, sewer, waste, garbage, that kind of thing. It doesn't impact people's owning of property 
they just come under the umbrella of our um, municipal services. So this is our annexation map. And again, give you reference, here's Northern Road, here's Ridgeview Road. So Litchford's lands were in this area and up in this area. And you can see the dates, I hope. Uh, these are the dates that these lands were annexed into Upper Arlington. So 46, 1948, and then over here in 1951, this is obviously where the high school is. So that did not become part of Upper Arlington until 1951. So just putting that on the timeline visually, and then again, noting that the high school property came in 1951, we're going to see a map here, um, but no, at the time that it was annexed, four different owners owned the high school property and that cemetery was still accepted and reserved in their deeds. So still part of the Litchford heirs, Litchford descendants to um, take care of. This is a 1950 map. It's the closest I can get to you to 51. So again, Northern Road and Ridgeview Road. And it's the first time we see on a map the graveyard, the, the GY uh, cemetery denoted there, highlighted. And the high school property, again, with four different names going on in this small section of land but none of them own that cemetery. So um, back to the, the timeline, um, in 1955, it was a busy year for the UA Board of Education. Um, they bought properties from people whose last name were Snap, Ackley, Wilson, and Benson. They all sell to the UA Board of Education, but they still have to gain ownership of the cemetery. And so that's worked through the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas to appropriate that cemetery site. And they uh, end up paying $1,600 plus agree to pay for moving and reinterment of the bodies. And the cemetery at that time um, in records is denoted as overgrown and long abandoned are the words that they use. This picture, I hope, gives you a sense of what the land would have looked like. Again, it's the new high school in 57 from the 1957 yearbook, but you can see even over here that it's, it's much more um, you know, open than we're used to seeing it today, just to get that sense of the lay of the land. So takeaways about the land um, from this, um, Pleasant lived and owned land um, long before Upper Arlington began. And it wasn't until we had been around, um, you know, till the 40s and the 50s that we, we annexed his lands and that the Litchford heirs um, were able to um, access, had the legal right to access and, and take care of that property um, through the time till the, the school district appropriated it for the school. Most of these documents are available through uaarchives.org where you can um, view the Pleasant Litchford collection so you can go access them and uh, do your own research if you'd like. So thank you, that's all. So you've assembled all these documents but, but the originals of those documents I assume are in county recorder's offices and, and mm -hmm. uh, courthouses yes. and, and other places. Yeah. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, Kim and Diane um, generously gave um, some of their research, we've gone off and, um, you know, access some of them ourselves as well, but yes. And we're gonna be continually adding, we're partnering with the library to try to get as many documents online, um, primary source, so that people can do their own um, poking around, if you will, to, um, to see the actual documents themselves. That's wonderful. I, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, if there are any young people who are watching tonight. I hope so. Uh, and, and I know this is being recorded so that there will be an opportunity for, for students in the future to study this. But if anybody's interested in becoming a historian or, or, or someone who cares about, uh, about the history, um, this really sounds like a treasure hunt in some respects mm -hmm. to find all of the information yes. that you were able to put together. Uh, so thank you, Diane, for putting that in a timeline for us and giving us a chance to, to see what happened to this land 
over the course of um, you know literally a couple hundred years. Um, uh, there's a question that uh, was asked in the, in the chat. Uh, do, do you did you happen to know, or maybe one of you that we're coming to will tell us um, uh, what led the Litchford heirs to um, sell their a uh, couple hundred acres uh, over the course of sixty years? Is is that will we be getting to that part of the story? <laughs> Well, they lived, a lot of them lived in California and still okay. live in California. Some live in New York City. Um, they became all very educated individuals. Um, one of his grandson was the first black to graduate from OSU Law School and his granddaughter, first black woman to graduate from OSU. Um, which are bachelors in, I believe it was teaching. This was in 1911, 1912. So they had a lot of education and they, they just branched out through the world. And um, still today, a lot of Yale graduates in that family, I notice. Okay. So they, they right. um, didn't stay around um, you know, after the family left, but of course, Anybody in the family could not sell to another black person if they wanted to because of the, the covenants and the deeds at that time. Okay. So if they wanted to sell it to one of their family members and they're a person of color, they couldn't do that. And so I, if I can pull on that thread for a minute, just mm -hmm. so that um, we are currently, the Historical Society is currently doing some research into, um, into those deed restrictions to get our arms around the actual um, extent to which they permeated deeds mm -hmm. in our community. And we're kind of in the middle of that and uh, look very much forward to sharing that information um, with the community sometime, definitely this year, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. But well, and I know we, we have more of the story to tell in part one relating to hidden roots, and then of course there's a part two coming up in about a week. So you'll want to you'll want to tune in for that as well. <laughs> uh, Rita, let me let me turn to you now. You're a historian and the founding chair of the James Preston Poindexter Foundation, which has long roots here. Uh, what did you and um, the rest of the Black community in Columbus uh, know about? Pleasant Litchford's family before the book and some of this came to our attention? Well, as a historian, you know that I have a lot to share, so I'll <laughs> do my best to give you a little background. But, uh, but thank you uh, for this opportunity to share some memories of a special time and place. I remember when Diane came to our genealogy group, the Afro-American Interest Group of Franklin County's uh, Genealogy Society, and was asking for our assistance to help her re research the history of the Litcher family, it brought back many, many memories. And we're not going to talk age, but we will, <laughs> we will go <laughs> back to you, OK? <laughs> uh, but when I was coming up, I remembered uh, the C.W. Bryant family as being uh, business persons and leaders in our community. And because I think I was closer in age to Neil, um, Neil Bryant, I remember him specifically as being um, that they were associated with being developers and, and builders in our community. Um, but I didn't know them personally, but, and, and of course not knowing uh, at, at that time that they were a part of the Litchford family. Um, but I do have memories of the hotel that was created by William Litchford. I think I'm pro correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he created the Litchford Hotel, which was downtown at Gay and 4th Street. And I remember going there for a fancy dinner because it had white tablecloths and all the goodies. And um, and, and in fact, two of my high school classmates um, performed at the Litchford Hotel and the building is long gone, but that was the singer, Nancy Wilson and 
the international saxophone player, Carl Sally. And Carl shares with me that he has fond memories uh, of that, of having participated in jam sessions and um, uh, uh, and that and they jammed with major entertainers of the day that would stay there at the hotel and and they always had great great crowds. So that's that's the other part of the story is about the Bryants, which we'll figure out a little later. But you know, research never goes in a straight line, and our <laughs> research of the early settlers of Franklin County. Um, which also included areas that were north of, of Columbus, but also they included Worthington and the Delaware area. And those early set, some of those early settlers that came around the 1830s, they were the Depths, the Poindexters, the Whites, and the Goods. Mm -hmm. and they all had very close relationships and ventures with one another back in those days. Um, you know, Pleasant being a, a blacksmith also had a relationship with David Jenkins, another of our earlier uh, settlers, who was a bill, also a builder and an artisan and was a very successful businessman who worked in fact on constructing the state house. So there is no surprise that they were all partners in many social justice events, the development of the faith uh, organizations and the need to create educational opportunities. And then they, most of them were also involved with the Underground Railroad Movement um, <clears throat> and that movement included John T. Ward, who was in Reynoldsburg, and his house still is there, by the way, and that was to the east of Columbus. And then there were other many leaders in the community, including Reverend Poindexter, who at that time lived at 45 North 4th Street, remember downtown. And the Bulls, who, li in the, who lived in the Clintonville area on High Street. And then you have the Depths, who were in the Delaware area. So you can see how that system would work and how they would move uh, those persons seeking fr freedom through our area. Um, you know, and it's also interesting, I can't go into all of the inner relationships and the marriages that occurred between those families, but I have met a Brenda Billinger, who is a descendant, I believe, of the Depths, but her great-great-grandfather was living next door to Grant Litchford on Zollinger Road, and that's reported in the 1920 census. Oh, my gosh. Yes. And... Um, and then I also, going back to what Kim was saying about cemeteries, you know, it definitely was not uncommon uh, for the need to develop your cemetery on your land because you weren't, it's amazing, even in death, there was segregation. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and in, in fact, Green Lawn Cemetery didn't vote to allow blacks to be buried in that in their cemetery until 1856. So yes, you know it's yes the the black community was aware of the Litchford story, but maybe not to its full extent because um, I found that their history was recorded in the International Frontiers of Americans program published in 1953-54. Um, and also I noticed that C.W. Bryant Jr. was uh, on their board of directors at that time. You know, I share with some students that 
history is really storytelling. Mm -hmm. And those roots are, are what help make us grow. But you know, this story was actually, and it's the story and roots were hidden in plain sight. And yet it was invisible to all of us. But now we can make the invisible visible. And that is, that is a, a thought and a concept shared by uh, Dr. Bunch, who is the uh, secretary of the Smithsonian. So I'm really excited that we have this opportunity to share this special time and place with, with our community and have the opportunity to enlighten our children for their, for their future education and opportunities. So I thank you for this opportunity and, and attention. Thank you. Well, and, and thank you, Rita, for, for everything you've shared. And, you know, it's, it may be hard for some to remember that the time we live in now is not like the time that existed 50 years ago or 75 okay. years ago or 100 years ago. Uh, and that for, for uh, you, you talked about some of the black families in, in central Ohio who were successful in any number of fields. Um, but, you know, we don't live very far from some of those communities or from where Poindexter Village you know, is, but, but we don't know the history. And as you said, it's storytelling and understanding each other's stories matters. Okay. It matters to an understanding uh, and the formation of a community. So I thank you for sharing that information with us. And, and um, Sandra, let, let me, if I may now turn to you. Um, I know you're involved in the heritage ministry, um, the, the keepers of culture as you're referred to at, um, at the Second Baptist Church. And you are a second generation historian. Um, <laughs> So if you wouldn't mind, tell us how Pleasant's history was captured and shared throughout the lifetime of the Second Baptist Church. Well, I want to be able to tell you a little piggyback on to what uh, Rita has said Please. about the Litchford Hotel. Now, there's a little button here that's green and it says share screen, but I really don't know how to do that. Well, so if you push on it. <laughs> If I push on it, I don't know what will happen. We'll, we'll so get I'm you back, little, not to worry. <laughs> I'm a little nervous to do that. But anyway, let's see what happens when I push on it. No, that doesn't help me at all. Uh, well, uh, let me, I guess, ask this, because uh, if you've got a PowerPoint or something, that's one thing. Is it, is it what you're holding in your hand? If you hold I'm it close to the it. camera like that, and I'm going to be quiet and you talk. OK, what I'm showing you is the Lipsford Hotel. That was a picture that I, I found on, on, the, on the pewter, as I call it. Uh, and it says next to it, uh, Lishford Hotel once stood at 90 North 4th Street in Columbus. Jazz band Raleigh uh, Randolph Sultans of Swing performed regularly at the Lichford Hotel. Pleasant Lichford's grandson, William H. Lichford, his family alter has an alternative of spelling, founded the hotel in 1916 for the African-Americans who could afford an elegant place to stay, but were denied accommodations at the segregated white hotels. The three-story brick hotel lasted for many decades, becoming a hot spot for events, dining and entertainment. The Litchford Grill, which was added in the hotel in 1930s, was later a dining room and assembly hall, provided a venue for some of the biggest names in jazz, and a gathering place for their devoted fans. So that's that part I wanted to share with you. Now, the other, I don't think you can see too well, but the name of Pleasant Litchford is at the bottom of this, this paper. And this is our, our church beginning, the Ohio uh, uh, Second General Assembly of State of Ohio, the, at this uh, state house where I went to get the information. Uh, they were uh, incorporating many churches that day and at the top of the page, it, uh, in section 11 on page 236, uh, it lists David Jenkins, George Butcher, 
Pleasant Litchford, Lewis Jenkins, N.B. Anderson, and their associates and successors be and there are hereby created a body politic and a corporate by the name of the Second Baptist Church of the City of Columbus, Franklin County. So that's the uh, official uh, connection our church has with Pleasant Litchford. He was uh, a, a one of the first deacons of, at the beginning of our church, and that would be uh, in 1936. But also the you very said, first. You said 1936. I'm sorry, 1836. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> a little, okay. little bit different there. A little bit different. Uh, Ezekiel Fields was at that time uh, designated to be our very first uh, minister, and uh, as Rita said, we belong to the Franklin County Genealogical Society. And I met a, a gentleman there named John Washington, uh, and his family was. Uh, uh, at the reunion, came as a reunion, you know, when you have reunions, you usually go to somebody's church. And uh, they came to Second Baptist in the 1990s. And uh, that's when we found out their connection to being related to Ezekiel Fields. And uh, uh, that Ezekiel Fields, the information they left with us was that he was buried in Litchford Cemetery. So that's why in the film, you see this stone because uh, the stones were taken and they got moved and broken. And this uh, tombstone ended up in a relative's backyard. And when she died, uh, she lived over on First uh, Street, I think First Avenue, and uh, her house was gonna be torn down. And so this to the tombstone is now in our meditation garden at Second Baptist Church. So that's why, and the rest of the family is buried in Green Lawn. So his body went to Greenlawn versus going to Union Cemetery. So that's, that's our main connection. And we do have uh, relatives of Ezekiel Fields still in our church, Marilyn Zimmerman and Roland Jackson. And uh, his mother was Irma Lash and it was her sister that had the stone in her backyard. And uh, this tombstone, he died in 1870. So it's maybe strange to talk about a tombstone, but to have a tombstone of your very first minister uh, uh, in your own churchyard area, it's very special. And uh, it's also in a memorial garden that's named after Sam and Vivian Mason, which just happened to be my aunt and uncle. So <laughs> that's just a little sidelight there. That's how I get to be the second generation, I guess. I'm following in my mother's footsteps to be a church historian. So that's, that's the part that I play. And so I'm known as the heritage lady. And uh, Rita and I, we, we crossed paths a lot. And we were very happy to uh, know Diane and Kim. Well, and, and it's wonderful. This collaboration has just been wonderful in terms of the fruit it's born. Um, and, and I guess if you've got, you know, history, your, your church is approaching 200 years of age, well, if, I, if I do the math right. We're, we're 185 this year. Yeah, you know, <laughs> so there's a lot of history to keep. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for, for sharing that with us, Sandra. Um, John, let me let me turn to you. You're the you're the anthropologist and the archaeologist, and and I know there's, you know, in in both the the work that was done back in the 1950s and then more recently with the construction of the new high school. Um, there was there was archaeological work that was done, and I wonder. Uh, yeah, I know you grew up in Upper Arlington. Um, you've been looking at the past through your professional work. I wonder if you'd share some of the local history, um, you know, that you've become aware of in your work, and then turn to us uh, and talk to us about how you felt when you when you discovered this information about Pleasant Litchford. And you're muted, John. All right, there, I think I got it. Carl, thank you so much. It's, it's uh, truly been a wonderful experience to work with these great people. And uh, that alone, I think, has been a major accomplishment. Um, but this project just keeps growing and growing and growing in what it offers. Um, growing up in Ar Upper Arlington, I went through the school system K through 12. Uh, through the grace of Upper Arlington, I had a chance to study abroad and live overseas. Um, and so I've always had this kind of dual interest in when cultures come together, as well as relating the past to uh, our lives today. 
And the Pleasant Litchford story, I think similar to you, came to me late. Um, I was working with some colleagues with a company in 2017, uh, Ohio Valley Archaeology. And um, one of my good friends there came over to me and said, hey, what do you know about the cemetery underneath your high school? And my jaw just dropped because as someone who's been very interested in local history, read up a lot about it, totally missed that completely. Uh, and so I said, Jared, what are you doing? You're, you gotta be pulling my leg. And he said, no, I'm, I'm absolutely serious about this. Uh, there's a lady I know, a uh, genealogist and historian coming in uh, who's gonna be talking about this. And that's when I had the fortune of meeting Diane Runyon uh, and really kind of getting acquainted with, with this amazing story. And um, I think it, it, it's been very helpful in that it's got me to really reflect on what I do as an archeologist and what we need to do to be able to, to gain value from these, these events that happened in the past. And, and I think it's it more and more over the last few years, uh, especially if you look at what we've gone through in the last 12 months, this story is becoming so central to the future direction of Upper Arlington. Uh, it touches on issue of social class. It touches on issues of racial discrimination. It touches on issues of equity. And we realize we have so much more to do. And there's such great lessons built into this history. Mm -hmm. have. And, and I think one of the strengths, the absolute strengths that as a community we have that other communities don't is that we have Second Baptist Church still in existence. We have direct descendants who are talking with us. We are extremely lucky in this. This, this uh, situation where particularly African-American cemeteries are being rediscovered or in many cases actually getting disturbed by modern construction is happening all over the country right now. It is really growing in terms of national interest, but those communities have been so separated from those places, those sacred places that the communities today have lost that touch, but we still have that. And to me, that's a very profound thing. It really changes my perspective on, on my relationship to the past, uh, as well as how it's critical for us moving forward. Um, and, and I think one thing I'd like to sort of go into a little bit, uh, Carl, is that, and for about eight years, I lived uh, in North Carolina. I lived in the Appalachian Mountains in the Western part of the state. And people presume there that the history of that part of North Carolina is predominantly a white history. It's a history of those white mountaineers. But when you live there and you get to know the people, you find out that there's been a strong African-American community there for 250 years. There are people of all different groups um, who have settled in that region. You have Melungeons who have kind of a mysterious origin where some of them are thought to have descended from uh, shipwrecked sailors from Spain or from Middle Eastern folk who somehow made their way up into the mountains, but they're all part of this integrated community. And when we look at Ohio's founding, particularly in that magical period, beginning around the 1820s up through the 1840s, when you had access, you had the canals come in, you had the roads come in, we had a lot of people coming here looking for that newfound freedom. And a big part of that freedom I see is tied into the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. That document is really why we're here today having this conversation, because that was the first recorded document really in world history that officially and explicitly banned uh, slavery. And that separated the Northwest Territory, what would become Ohio from Virginia and from all of the other preceding states. And so, you know, when we look at Pleasant Litchford, when we look at that community, almost all of those individuals came from the Richmond area of Virginia, uh, Richmond and Lynch, Lynchburg area of Virginia. And I think it's very likely that they were an integrated community before they even came to Ohio. And they had a concerted plan. They wanted to build a community in a free state um, where they could thrive and they could grow. And as uh, Diane pointed out so well, um, in Virginia, Virginia didn't want these people there because these people were freemen. They had, through their own hard labor or other efforts, had gained freedom. They had gained 
uh, their manumission papers, they were a threat to the social order in Virginia. But who were these people? Well, in my opinion, they were probably the very best people Virginia had. They were some of the hardest working people. They were people who through great discrimination and barriers were able to pull themselves up, purchase the freedom for their family, relocate to Ohio, and, and basically build a community here. So I don't care where you're from, these people are critical to our city. They are critical to our community here in Ohio. And so we owe a great debt of gratitude to the effort that they have done. And as Diane said, they've gone on and they're national leaders, people in this family. Uh, and that I think speaks to a lot of these people that came up with that group. I mean, the Depths, uh, the Whites, the, uh, uh, the Bryants, the Litchfords, all of them had this kind of contribution. Uh, so it's, it's a very profound thing, I think, to think about. Um, but I also want to put this in the framework that they were also coming into a multicultural society. Um, here in Ohio, we had a lot of Native, uh, Native American groups that were well established here. Particularly in our area of Northwestern Columbus, we had a strong Wyandotte presence, really from the 1750s up until the, their removal in the 1840s. Um, many people in Ohio and Columbus have heard of Chief Leatherlips. He lived with a community of over 100 Wyandots up near what is now Delaware, or not Delaware, but Dublin. Um, and those people would have regularly traveled up and down the Scioto River in the area that's now Upper Arlington. And the Wyandot were a really important group. They never were very large, but they were basically the chief negotiators between native and uh, Anglo relations in the Ohio Valley. So they worked with many of the other tribes. They worked with the white settlers that were coming in. They also were very interested in the African-American community. Um, the the uh, settlement at Upper Sandusky actually had um, a number of black members of the tribe. So they were integrated in the tribe. And there also was a separate African community that was able to establish itself next to the reservation. So at the time that President Litchford is coming into central Ohio, the Wyandots are not some side group that's fading out. They were very well connected and powerful in terms of having good relationships, trade, um, and other interactions um, in the Ohio Valley. And I think another interesting tie-in is that the Wyandotte mission up in Upper Sandusky was the first Methodist mission in the United States. And it was basically founded by a gentleman of mixed heritage. It was founded by a guy named John Stewart, who was of uh, African-American, Native American, and white heritage. And he was really the first to convert large numbers of the Wyandotte to the Christian faith. And so these people were, were very involved um, and active with what was happening in central Ohio. Um, and um, as a part of this, uh, Rita particularly touched on this, we had a number of African-American and black settlements and other settlements of color get established in central Ohio and they were kind of satellite communities. So we, we talk about the debt settlement, we talk about Africa Road and Africa up near Westerville that people know about. But there was a whole bunch of other ones that are less known. So just right here around Upper Arlington, we had um, one near the intersection of Lane Avenue and Kenny Road called Seagrave. There was the Sellsville settlement associated with the circus down near Chambers Road and King Avenue. You had extensive numbers of, of people of color living there. You had a place called Mudsock out in Hilliard, which was an African-American community. And uh, just recently in working with some of my colleagues and friends from the Ohio uh, History Connection, uh, an African-American cemetery was just discovered this past year up near the corner of Avery Road, uh, kind of intermediate between Pleasant Litchford's land heading on up to the Depp Settlement. So, you know, I think as, as Rita and Diane were saying, these people were integrated. They were an integrated community. And one thing that profoundly strikes me is when you look at the layout of our roads in Upper Arlington. And if you haven't done this, take a drive from Fifth Avenue, drive north on North Star Road, and pay attention to where that road makes its first little kink. And where it makes that little kink is right at Ridgeview Road. Because originally, that road went up to Ridgeview Road and did a 90 degree turn to the west, 
right there on Pleasant Litchford's property line. And so that was basically a road to get you to Litchford's property. And I don't know if it's coincidence, but I think it deserves more attention. And I've been looking into this is that the road itself, North Star, it's a North oriented road, but the North Star or the drinking board is also basically your direction that you give people who are runaway slaves. If you want to get to freedom, if you want to get to Canada, you're going to follow that North Star. So you have a road coming off of Fifth Avenue that's going to take you right to Litchford's place. That's going to take you where you're going to get, you're going to get protection and you can get transported over to the depths and then on up to Canada. Um, I think this is added um, indication that we may well have that connection there. Um, well, John, let me let me stop you for just a second. I want to I want to get to some of the um, the uh, remnants of the cemetery. I yeah. want to remind our audience that uh, if you'd like to ask some questions, I'm going to ask probably one more question and then get you involved in this conversation. If you'd like to become involved, please put your questions in the chat. We'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, you've got a number of experts here, and we've got probably about another 10, 15 minutes uh, that we can entertain questions in. Um, so John, let me let me turn just a second. You've you've spoken, you know, to some of the importance of recognizing uh, the history from which these lands came and these people came who currently uh, yeah. occupy the land we call Upper Arlington, and um, and that the the you know it's a much more uh, diverse group if you go back some time. Obviously, Native American long ago. Uh, but more recently, uh, you know, African American, uh, Caucasian, I mean, a, a number of immigrant groups. Um, and, and it is important to tell that story. And let me, let me, let me jump back to Rita for just a second to ask um, Rita whether you have any thoughts about the importance of continuing to incorporate the story of Pleasant Litchford into the fabric of, of what Upper Arlington is. Well, you know, first, I'd like to correct myself. I, I don't know why I'm thinking Delaware this evening, but I meant to say Dublin. <laughs> that the Litchfords were around. It was that, that Litchford, not the Litchford, the, the Depp um, community is across from the um, zoo up in Dublin. So I just wanted to correct myself there. Well, you know, as a historian, I look to this, this is American history. This month we are celebrating black history, but actually it's American history. And our children need to be diverse in order to, to function in a di di diverse world. We're not a set, we're not a, 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 an isolated world anymore. So I think when we talk about our local history, it again, and that we keep going back to that tree concept but that's the core. Our local history is our core. And, you know, I think we need to talk about the McCoys. We need to talk about the Neals and the Deschlers. And, and one of my favorites is Luca Sullivan from Franklin. And all of this is our local history, but it is our roots. It's our foundation. And, and, and I think we do a disservice to our young people when we don't equip them to, to, to understand the history and the stories of our past and our connectiveness and our common interest and common, common um, wealth, because we have a wealth in each other. I mean, this is rich history. This isn't some, uh, da, da, da. this is rich stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. And our children need to have it. And so I just think, and I applaud Upper Arlington mm -hmm. for sharing and incorporating this history and putting value on its own history. And I think Upper Arlington is an example for many other communities surrounding us. Right. So I applaud this this community for accepting its own history because it's American history. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And, and you know, so important. And I think 
all of us who live through 2020 understand how important it is for communities to begin to talk about issues that maybe they haven't discussed for the last 50 years uh, and, and recognize the commonalities they have in their history. Uh, and we do that by sharing some of these stories. Uh, Kristen, there was a question in the, um, in the chat that asked what, what today, uh, you, if you looked at the street map today, sort of what would the boundaries be of the Litchford property? And I, I think you touched on that, but if you could sort of generally describe where in Perry, what was the Perry Township, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the 137 acres that the school property is on, um, it's a little bit to the west of that, and then all the way, as John alluded to, to North Star Road. So it kind of stretched that high school properties north south, and then the it was the little east of a little west of there, and then over to North Star, and then the other property, as Kim alluded to, I think at the beginning, Saint Agatha Northern Park. Tremont School, Tremont Center kind of area, okay. um, generally speaking. Uh, I think there's a question about um, the uh, whether this history is going to be part of the, the curriculum at school, uh, and I don't I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I guess we have the superintendent, so we may get an answer to that at some point. <laughs> But um, uh, it, it certainly is interesting history. And, um, and uh, as I said, in part, this recording may serve, uh, but also all of these resources are, are, are wonderful resources for this history. Paul, well, I, don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, just, I was just no. reading a question out of the chat. Carl, the answer is yes. <laughs> I will be brief. Yes, it is. And uh, I'll talk more about that in the closing, but yes, it will be. Okay, and then and then there was a question, in, and John, this this may be in part for you, that related to essentially the the excavations, the removal of remains from uh, the land uh, that's by the high school to Union Cemetery, uh, and whether uh, we could discuss that. And as I said, it may be you, it may be others who've done some research. Do you want to start us off on that? Yeah, Carl, absolutely. Um, I think one thing that with our recent investigations associated with the cemetery and also the school was a question is simply, are there material remains left that tie us to the Litchford period, ties us to the people there? Was there actually, as was indicated in the film, is there actually evidence of people still being buried in that cemetery? And as a result of this work, we can say yes. Now, when they did the removals in 1955, um, I tried to track down and get information on the specific details of were the records kept specifically of who did the who did the recoveries? Did they take pictures? Did they take notes? These are basic things that an archaeologist would do. And apparently there's no indication that they were. Um, but this was 1955. There were no uh, federal laws protecting archaeological sites at the time. Um, it was not necessarily in an expectation that this would be done. However, I will say that even in 1955, uh, if you really wanted to see if there were people in that cemetery, you would do a controlled excavation of that whole half acre. Um, it would take an amount of time, it would take a fair amount of work, but it certainly could have been done. Um, but what was found recently this past summer was that there were three burials that were relocated uh, two individuals had been partially excavated, probably back in the 1950s, and one individual had been apparently completely missed. That individual was completely intact. Um, and so I'm very proud and very glad that Upper Arlington was willing to take that step to hire Ohio Valley Archaeology to do a controlled excavation, to use geophysics to try to zero in on the area, to use old maps to figure out where those remains were most likely to be so that now we're at a point uh, we can take this to the next level. And this is one thing that has really struck me with this. As an archeological site, this project is dealing with a place that's very difficult because it's been so altered by previous construction 
your installation of utilities, all kinds of things. But the real value of this, I think, is not in the archaeology. It's in the human rights aspect of this. This is bringing responsibility and justice to those individuals who were buried there, to the family members, to the school, and all of us in Upper Arlington who want to show that we actually demonstrably care about this. Uh, and that is an extremely important message. So that even if, as it is likely at this point, there may well be additional human remains there, they are not associated with headstones that we can tell. The headstones have been removed. Individuals have been disturbed from their burials, so there could be human remains that are not associated with burials, but just intermixed into the soil. Um, but I still think everyone on this panel um, wants to make sure that we do the right thing, that we take that good faith effort to try to recover those remains. And Ohio Valley, as an example, uh, particularly with the one burial that was nearly complete, has been working with a professor uh, down at Marshall University and they're looking at doing DNA. So we may able to tra trace a lineage of that individual so that that individual's living descendants have a real say as to what happens with them. We can do that today in, in 2020. Couldn't do that in 1955. Is that expensive? Is that complicated? Absolutely. Is it worth doing? Absolutely. Uh, and then last thing I'll mention real quickly is, is I also got involved in this in 2018 I also work with the school board to try to identify remains of the school. Um, because again, having some sort of physical touch. When you say the school. The school, the colored school. I, I wanted to make sure we understood which yeah, school you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. On the 1872 Atlas, which was identified by Kim and Diane. Yeah. And I got a friend of mine to bring a uh, ground penetrating radar out. I borrowed some equipment from archaeological services consultants and other a uh, group of archaeologists I work with here in Ohio. And we went out and surveyed that area, also did metal detection. No clear evidence of remains of the school, but we were working in the area where the, the temporary athletic fields were built because of the construction going on the high school to continue sports. They had to move all the sports over to Northern Park. But we really think that the actual school was probably underneath what's now the senior center but it was still worth looking. And as a result of doing that, I've got maybe four nails. They're cut nails, they aren't hand forged, but they date to the time of the Litchfords. So they may be from a fence, they may be from a shed, they may be from other kinds of things, but it's a tangible piece of evidence from the right time period. And, you know, I've, I've done archeology span in Cyprus, I've done it in Greece, I've done it over many parts of the United States and been involved in some wonderful projects. But the most moving artifact I have ever found was found in association with that school. And that was the identif identification of a glass bead that dates to the late 18th century, was the type of bead that was manufactured in Europe specifically for the slave trade. And for that bead to be on that land could well be an indication that someone physically brought that with them on the Middle Passage across the Atlantic Ocean. Most likely a woman did that because women would wear beads and particularly beads of this color have great significance. That to me is an extremely moving piece. That is something that is not only important to me, but I think is important to everybody who cares about this story. It humanizes it. It connects it with this broader global event that we all have to face up to. This international trade in human beings is still profoundly affecting everyone on the planet today. Um, when we look at you know, our problems with race and social inequality in the United States, we need to remember this story. And so that's kind of where we are with the archeology. span What's coming up next. Okay, it's gonna to need to be brief, John. <laughs> yeah. What's coming up next is that when the demolition of the school uh, happens later this year, there's gonna be additional investigations to do that due diligence, to try to recover those remains. And I'm so proud that we have this collaboration of people who are gonna to work together to try to bring the best possible resolve to this that we can. And it's truly been an honor to be a part of this, to you know, be an archeologist and also be from Upper Arlington and offer something that hopefully can tie people back together. I would do this, I would do this in a heartbeat all over again. 
Well, oh, thank you. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I know we're coming to the end of our time together this evening, um, but, but as you've indicated, we've really just begun to scratch the surface. And we, we're trying to dig a little deeper into, into the history here and into this story. Um, but it, it's, it's wonderful that you were able to share the roots with us. And, and we'll hear from, from Toya Williams, one of the Litchford descendants in the next program. So there, there are branches still to this day. You know, I, um, there were, I was gonna do a lightning round and try to answer one or two of the questions in the chat. But I, I think we, we literally are running up against the time um, when I need to turn this back over to Paul. So let me let me say, um, you know, just from from as a matter of personal privilege, um, it, it has been wonderful to be with you all this evening. Uh, as I said, I I went to school here, um, didn't know about this history, uh, lived in this community for many years, didn't know about this history. Uh, sometimes it's hard to feel like you're part of a community if you don't see yourself in the community. And, and I hope that the stories that we are discovering will become part of the stories that our children get to hear in school uh, and see evidence of in school so that you know those who are uh, of African descent will see themselves represented in the history of Upper Arlington. And those who aren't of African descent will understand that there were people of African descent in the history that became Upper Arlington. Uh, so I, I, um, I thank you for this privilege of being with you and for all the work you've done. My goodness, it's, it's hard. And, and Diane or Kim, I don't know if one of you has a book. I know the book's available on Amazon. Uh, I'll put in a plug, <laughs> you know, that, that um, uh, if people want to dig a little bit deeper into that, uh, they're welcome to do so. But I, but I also, before I, before I turn it to Paul, just want to thank you, Kemi Jeter, J.P. Dorval, and, and Catherine Kennedy for permitting me this opportunity uh, to share this time with you. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Paul. Well, thanks a lot, Carl, and thanks so much for facilitating this great conversation tonight. We truly appreciate your, uh, your leadership. Um, I just want to say that this panel and everyone uh, who has been involved uh, in this work are just dear, dear people. And it has been such an honor uh, to be a part of this work. And while none of us can go back and change what happened in the 1950s, we can do the right thing now. And we are really uh, committed as a school, a community, a historical society, residents, all of these partners coming together to do the right thing now. And uh, I am so proud, uh, of, so proud to be a part of that team of, 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 of people. And I will tell you just as a school district, when we think about this land where the cemetery was, please know uh, at the beginning of the construction process and the planning process, actually to this day, if you would go to our website and look at the plans for the new high school, the area where the cemetery was, uh, was slated to be a part of our parking lot and to be paved over. That will not be the final plan. Uh, so we will be updating and changing those plans and the land uh, where the cemetery was will not be paved over, will not be a parking lot. Uh, it will be turned into a park-like setting and will forever be remembered and honored as the sacred land that it is, including signage. We, we can never again allow this rich history to be forgotten. And you asked about us uh, teaching this, this, this history in our schools. And please know that we're, we are updating uh, all of our history. And Boy, I, I, I couldn't say it better than, than, than Rita. So I'm just going to say just what Rita said. I am all in on that, right? Uh, this is all of our history, right? And we need to teach all of our history. We need to be honest about all of our history. And we are going to be doing that uh, in, in our schools. So again, uh, just thanks to everyone for being with us this evening. Um, and I hope you'll join us a week from Saturday on February 27th from 1030 to noon as we continue this conversation and look at how our community intends to carry the story of the Litchford family forward. So thanks again for being with us tonight and we'll look forward to seeing everybody on February 27th.